me. I'll be sitting with you for your time. take the microphone away from me. I did. I'm did you see it. that? I'm going to use it later. Ah. Yeah. Well, you'll have to come up with me. Come on. Come on, Philip. You're going to you're going to you join the ranks of us children. Come on, come come sit down. <laughs> there we go. Hey, we're all big family up here. Right? Well, we're the we're the children of God, regardless of our age. <laughs> okay. I Today we're going to kind of remind us of a sermon that we had a couple of weeks ago about a, do you guys remember that? Uh, the big a fish. Big, a big one. And we were talking yeah, about how yeah. um, Jesus had, or God had asked Jonah to do something and he hid, right? Do you remember that? Do you guys, and we were talking about how sometimes we don't want to do what our parents ask us to do. Yeah. Okay, well, we're going to keep talking about that. Are you excited, Isabel? Yeah, she's so excited to talk about this. All right. Growing up, I could always tell when my mom wanted me to do something and when she really wanted me to do something. You know how I could tell the difference? She, she, would, get, yell. she would yell. Did your mom yell at you, Neely? Really? What is your middle name, Neely? Joe. Joe, Neely Joe Hutto. Yeah, have you ever heard that? Uh -huh. Or when she says, Neely Joe, can you tell the difference in that? Which, which motivates you more? Neely Joe or Neely Joe, come here. Which one motivates you more? The first one motivates you more. You guys hearing that back there? Okay. You got it, Megan? All right. So she knows the difference. Okay. What if your dad looks at you and he winks or if he crosses his arms? Which one motivates you more? When he crosses his Brian? You listening? Okay. So there's a difference in what motivates us, right? Yes? Okay. Who's this down here? Kellen? Can you tell the difference when your mom wants you to do something and when she really wants you to do something? Yeah. Okay. Well, my mom always, she'd call me by my nickname, which is Tessie. So where if I heard Tessie Renee, I knew she really loved me a lot. But if she said Teresa Renee, I could tell the difference, right? So we're going to keep talking about that because the, the scripture today is Paul has written a letter to the people who live in Corinth, right? And he even has to write a second letter because they're kind of not getting what he needs them to know about. You guys heard these stories before? So Pastor Mike's going to talk to us a little bit more about what motivates us to do something. Does a hug motivate us or does a finger in our face motivate us? What do you think? Finger? You know, oh, my. Okay. Parents. <laughs> Loving on them. Yeah. You are a great artist. Did you know that? Yes. You have the best smile. Yes. Hey, let me go help you sort those clothes out. Does that motivate you? Hey, here's your, your money. Here's the money for emptying the dishwasher. Motivation? Do it right now. Okay. All right, we got it? So when mom is smiling at us or dad is shaking his finger at us, we kind of know the difference, right? Okay. So Pastor Mike's going to help us with that in just a second. Got it? All right, let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, we're so thankful that we have the chance to come together on this beautiful day. 
Um, Forgive us when we forget what really motivates us and how much you love us. Because we know you love us and we know you want us to do the right thing just because it's the right thing to do. And uh, help us remember that through our week. Amen. All right, let me have the mic back. I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it. Good morning. Good morning. I may have been in the second grade, third grade. It was around in October, November. And I told my grandmother that I wanted to find a way of making some money so I could buy Christmas presents for my family. And as grandmothers do, she came up with a bargain. She said, if you'll make your bed up between now and December, the 15th, I'll give you a dollar so you can buy. Back then you could buy presents for a dollar. And she, and I said, okay. And so every day for about, I don't know, six weeks or so, I got up and I made up my bed. And I told her. And grandmothers, are like this. If you don't have a grandmother like this, you need one. She handed me the dollar and she said, okay, you've proven you can make your bed up for a dollar. You're going to continue to make your bed up because it's the right thing to do. <laughs> and so I kicked Karen out of bed this morning so I could make it up. I have been making up my bed ever since I was in the second grade because it was the right thing to do. I did it for money to begin with, and now I just do it because there's something inside of me that tells me to do it. Maybe it's my grandmother's voice that tells me to do it, or maybe it's Karen's voice that tells me to do it. It gets done. What motivates... That, that is the topic for the morning. What motivates us to do what we do? Some of us were motivated to eat our Brussels sprouts. If you don't eat those Brussels sprouts on your plate, no dessert. Some of us didn't have a dog that liked Brussels sprouts, and so we had to eat the Brussels sprouts. Or... If you don't eat your Brussels sprouts, no TV. Reward punishment. Some of us learned how to eat nutritious food with that reward and punishment. But eventually, what motivated us to eat well had to come from some other place than reward or, or punishment. Speaking of food, how many of you have been lined up at McDonald's every day hoping to be one of those 100 people who would uh, get your free Big Mac if you practice some form of love. You all saw the Super Bowl commercials. From last week until Valentine's Day, they're picking 100 people at selected stores um, to do something. Are you all... You all are into commercials or somebody's heard of that. Hey. You come up to the line and say, okay, you order your French fries and they say, okay, we'll give you your French fries if you call your mama and tell her you love her. Say French fries wouldn't be enough to do that. Um, <laughs> or we'll give you... Uh, if you, if you do a group hug with all those around you li lined up, if you show your loving, we'll give you whatever it is that you, you've ordered. How many of you would be motivated to love your brother or sister for a quarter pounder? Do they still sell a quarter pounder? Do they? Okay. There's something about associating a, a Big Mac 
two beef patties, special sauce. You remember that law commercial? It, 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 there you go, Alice. <laughs> there's something about a, there's something about uh, thinking that I'm going to love somebody for a Big Mac that just doesn't work for me. I don't know what it is, but maybe I just have high standards. I don't know. What motivates? What motivates us to do what we? What we do. I remember. Um, I remember Michael, our son. I think he was in junior high school. He uh, at the dinner table one night. Michael says, "I don't care about grades." Okay. He says, "I just like to learn." We said, where'd you get an idea like that from? <laughs> that learning is its own reward. Well, uh, he's weird. <laughs> the grades came. The grades came. But that's not why, that's not why he studied. And liked to, he just liked learning. Learning was its own self-validating value. He didn't need anything else but just the joy or the light of, of learning. George MacDonald in his book, A Curate's Awakening, tells the story of a conversation with an Anglican priest one evening and an attorney, a lawyer. They're outside and the sun's going down and the uh, curate, the priest, the Anglican priest uh, chapel is sort of silhouetted against the, the setting sun, and the attorney says, pointing over to the chapel, do you really believe any of that stuff? <clears throat> and then he said, be honest. You became a priest in order to make a living. You do it for the salary, don't you? And as the story is written, he had to admit to himself that that was the reason that he went into the ministry. Paul, as Teresa alluded to, is writing to the Corinthians. There are opponents in the Corinthian church that are trying to undermine Paul's ministry. And so Paul is put in a position of having to defend himself. Some things aren't worth responding to, but Paul feels that he needs to respond. For you see, Paul had decided to remove all question about his motivation for preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. And so he refused to take any financial support from the churches that he helped start. You may remember that one of the, one of the, uh, the metaphors or analogies used for why those who were preaching the gospel and tending to the churches deserved uh, support was um, the ox. So if, if you're working the ox out in the field, don't you feed it? We preachers were equated to being like an ox, I guess, that needed to be fed. And, but Paul refused. Paul refused to take any kind of financial support because he didn't want anyone questioning his motives. And he goes on to explain that his motives are that when he encountered Jesus on the Damascus Road, he experienced abundant life and God laid, he calls it an obligation on him. He could not not share what he had received with others. That's why he did it. And he goes, and he goes on to refer to the blessing 
that comes. He says, I do it all for the sake of the gospel so that I may share in its blessings. Receiving the good news, sharing the good news continues the blessing, Paul said. Now, his opponents were using this, I thought it was very creative logic, in fact. He says, Paul, the reason that you're not taking anything for what you do is because what you do isn't worth anything. <laughs> Have you ever heard the, the logic, don't offer a program or a seminar or a workshop for free because people won't appreciate it? Charge something so they'll feel some investment in it and that it's worth something. And so don't give something to somebody free because they may assume that uh, it's not of any value. And that was the logic being used by Paul's opponents. Paul isn't accepting anything for what he does because what he does isn't worth anything. And that's what Paul tries to respond to, that there is a worth or a value that you can't put a dollar amount to. I have been fortunate in the churches that I've served over the years. I've, I've never asked for a salary increase. I've always felt that the churches I served were very generous in terms of their salaries, this one included. And I've always had a hard time figuring out how do you, how do you put a dollar value on what a pastor does. And I've always wondered why what one pastor does in one setting, which looks almost exactly like what another pastor does in another setting, why the salaries are different when both are doing the very same thing. But one is in a well-to-do congregation and one is in a poor congregation. That it just, I've, I've always struggled with being a pastor and, um, and my remuneration. I've always also felt that uh, um, other, staff, other staff should share in whatever um, the church is, is paying or has the ability to pay. Why, I guess every pastor at some point or another asks that question, why am I doing what I do? Am I doing it just for the money or is it for another reason? And what is that other reason? It comes from the heart, it comes from deep down, it comes from that relationship with God, it comes from having been loved and sharing that love with others. The scouts begin their life as a scout motivated by ranks and uh, badges that they earn by what they do. But it's toward the end of the value becoming more than the little patch that they wear. Soon, the little patch and its value fades away, and the good scout learns that there's an inherent, intrinsic value in learning or in doing, in practicing what that little badge or that pin uh, symbolizes. And that's true for uh, the highest rank in scouting, eagle. I have been to Eagle Court of Honors, and I know that that, that status, that accomplishment, which will go, will follow that young man throughout his life. To be an eagle is to, is to have accomplished something that's recognized by business and industry, government. But I've been to Court of Honors, and I know that there's more to it and they know there's more to it than the pen or the badge. 
or the rank because I've heard them express gratitude to those who have helped them reach that accomplishment. I've seen their videos, and I know that what matters most to them, again, is not the award, but the people and what they did with those people to reach that accomplishment. Why do we do what we do? What motivates us? Where does it come from? I think it comes from a sense, as Paul said, it comes from a sense of call, a claim on us. Something touches us deeply so that we know we are going to hurt that which matters most to us inside of us if we, if we say no and don't do. What? that call tells us to do. Bart Sims is one of our scout leaders. And I've asked Bart, Bart, why do, you, why do you do this? Why do you spend so much time with these young men over, uh, over all the months and the years that you spend it? Would you come on up so they can see you? And Bart, thank you for, uh, uh, we have two troops that meet here, one we, one we sponsor, uh, we're the charting organization. The other uses our, our space. That, uh, that's Bart's troop. Bart? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Well, uh, right before the service this morning, Mike kind of ambushed me up front and uh, asked if I could deliver anything. And so it motivates me to scout. Uh, and all kind of like little standard answers came into um, my head. I want to spend time with my son. I want to go camping. I was a Boy Scout when I was a youth, and I liked it a lot. Uh, but I've been a scout leader now for 11 years, and over time that kind of changed a little bit why I wanted to scout. Um, one, the program is an incredible program and the things we teach our young men and young girls now in, in scouting. And then that kind of changed a little bit more too, the more I kind of went into it. Um, I have never really, <clears throat> God's touched my heart in a way uh, as that happened before. He's never talked to me that way. Maybe he has, maybe I wasn't listening, but this time I listened. And it just became a very important part of my life. Then a little bit later, a very wise scoutmaster, an older gentleman, as I was going through some scoutmaster training, came to me and he told me, he says, he says, Bart, if you're lucky and you work very, very hard and you do everything right, if you're very, very lucky, one time a young man will come up to you and stick his hand out and say thank you. And he goes, and that's all you ever need to scout. It's one time. If you can make a difference in one young person's life, everything you pour into this, is totally worth it. And I took that to heart, and, that, and that's exactly why I scout. So hopefully I can make a difference in just one young person's life. And I think that's for all of us. If we can make the difference in just one person's life, what we can do. So long and short of it, why I scout, turns out uh, uh, I was a, I'm a Boy Scout my entire life, but sometimes I didn't even know it. And that's what Paul said. I read the verse. He says, I do what I do to share in the blessing. When we make a difference in another person's life, we share in the blessing that we've received from that person who's made a difference in ours. What motivates us to do what we do? During Lent, I'm asking Sunday school classes and groups to spend some time in what I'm calling prayerful conversation about what motivates us as a church. What is motivating us? What, what do we sense is the call of Christ to be his witness in this place and in this time? I put together a, a guide for those prayerful conversations if you're not a member of a Sunday school class, find one that's going to be doing this and join them or put your own group together. Uh, you can do this with neighbors or friends. Just let me know and I'll give you that conversation guide. It's designed for three sessions, but it may well be that once you get into those topics, those questions, you can spend all of Lent uh, in conversation. And then what I'm asking is all the groups who have met 
provide their holy offerings to the church council who will take them and have prayerful conversation over what you all have seen and heard that will give this church a vision for how it will enter the future, attempting to be faithful to what Christ is calling it to be and do. What motivates us? When money doesn't motivate us, or reward doesn't motivate us, or punishment doesn't motivate us, where is that love of God deep in our hearts that motivates us? You all have it in yours. I experience it every day, and I give God thanks.